So, hey folks, and welcome to another exciting episode of Bridging the Gap, the show that helps you ultimately highlight the, the issues that teenagers are facing, providing step-by-step -step guidance on how to overcome those issues and challenges and how to ultimately help teenagers to live the best kind of life they can. Hey folks, welcome. I'm John Morris, an author, speaker, teacher, and artist. And I'm really excited to be here with you guys today. I specialize in working with teenagers and families and I make up one half the team. My brand new co-host is all the way from the United States and I'm really excited to welcome Alicia McDonald. Alicia, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you here. I'm good. It's a beautiful sunny day. How's the weather by you guys? It's a little cloudy, but it's not snowing. So that's that's a plus. A plus. <laughs> Although the snow, I have to say from photos that I've seen, snow in New York absolutely looks stunning. It really does. It's, um, it's and, gorgeous. Uh, yeah, it, it's tremendous. So hopefully <laughs> we'll make it out there at some point because I think we're going to do fantastic things there. But folks, awesome. we want to welcome you to a show that's very unlike anything else that's out there. It's a show that really focuses on teenagers and the struggles that they face, the battles that they're going through, and ultimately how we can help um, things really make sense. So the idea of the show is to be short, sharp, and give you clear guidance on how to overcome these issues. And we're going to essentially try to tackle three topics in 30 minutes. So with that in mind, let's begin with the first one. Alicia, would you say that many teenagers around the world, from your experience, have struggled with self-image? Absolutely. Um, I definitely dealt with that uh, growing up. And that was even in a time when we had the internet, but we didn't really have it so accessible as it is today. We didn't have smartphones until I was in high school. Um, <laughs> that wasn't... So the internet on our phones wasn't a thing. So you have all these different um, influences kind of constantly coming at you. And even, you know, pressure from your parents and your, and your mentors and even your peers, um, it's, it can be very confusing trying to figure out really who you who you are. Brilliant. And, and, and I completely agree. Um, you know, again, I, I think there's maybe five years between Alicia and, my, and myself, you know, and mm -hmm. I grew up at a time where mobile phones were just really starting to be a thing. There was no internet on them. You could hold 10 text messages and you yeah. played a game called Snake. <laughs> and that's exciting as it was. Yeah. And it had a big aerial as well. Um, but before we get off track, uh, what do you feel that particularly the biggest struggles are with self-image? I think it's 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 this internal battle. It's like you have, I feel like you have two ideas of what you should or want to be. And then that's exactly it. It's either this is what I need to be. This is what everyone expects me to be. And this is who I really am. And I feel like, especially in your younger teen years, you're, you're really figuring out who that real you is yeah. and maybe what you should be a little bit. And I think it's trying to find that combination and of the two together. That's a great answer because it's one of the things that I personally, this isn't in the notes, by the way, folks, um, but this is one of the things that I personally am going through now, regardless of your age, it doesn't matter whether you are 220 or 200, hypothetically speaking. A lot of the time we are expected in society, and it doesn't matter whether it's in the United States, whether it's Australia, whether it's here in the UK, we're expected to put up a what I call a false self. It's, it's the whole idea of how we're meant to behave, how we're meant to talk, the things that we're meant to see. And, you know, the, the real self inside you, especially if you're really a passionate and creative person, you can feel it screaming sometimes to the point, I want to get out, I want to get out, I want to be who I am. And a lot of the time, because that false self is constantly having to be presented, a lot of people just really, really struggle with that. So when you can reach a place that I'm now getting to, this is a process, folks. That's the first thing I can tell you. Um, but when you can reach that place where you can present your real self to people and not worry about needing to be approved by other people, it's an incredible place. But that's a teaching for another time um, before we get too far in depth. But if I can give you guys three steps right now, to really improve your self-image of yourself. It's this. The first thing is stop comparing yourself to others. Because when you are comparing yourself to others and you're trying to be all these other things, you're trying to be all these other people, you stop being you. You stop being the thing that's really, really special. That's the first thing. The second thing is, and Alicia, I, I want to get your take on this as well, 
you got to stop focusing on social media and the falsehood that's there. Folks, I've been in the bodybuilding scene. I know about health and fitness. I see the stuff that's there, and I see how much of it is actually photoshopped and doctored out. These are bodies that, believe it or not, they may look good on the outside, but they're not all that healthy on the inside. Alicia, what, what's your take on, on social media and the images that they present? So I definitely agree that it, it can be quite insidious. Um, I will say... I've noticed a little bit of a trend, especially I feel like in my age group right now. So I'm in my later twenties, um, where us women are starting to be like, you know, this is, this is ridiculous. Like we, we got to stop doing this. And so I've seen people go from like, this is me with a filter on, this is me not with a filter on. It's a difference. You know, this is how I look with my, you know, my underwear this way. I pull them up a little bit. I look like I work out. It's, and it's starting to become a little bit more normal. And I'm hoping that it does because it, social media is there and, and there's really no avoiding it. So if we can use it as a tool to kind of teach women, especially younger women, you know, that what you see is not real and it's okay to be, you know, to put on the filter, look nice. It's a confidence booster, but that is not reality. And I think it, I think it can be a good teaching tool. I absolutely agree. And I think, you know, one of the things that we have seen uh, probably over the last 20 years is the rate in which technology has increased. And boys and girls, if you're watching this, okay, you know, I come from a, from a slower period in time. I sound like an ancient fossil when I say this, um, but I do. And I'm talking 30 years, okay? And the difference between when I was three years old to where I am now and the difference in technology is insane. The difference in computer graphics, the difference in what we're doing here. Zoom wasn't even a thing. Webcams yeah. weren't even a thing. Maybe, <laughs> maybe early primitive webcams. Okay. Um, but the quality was nowhere near this good. There was, you know, very little stuff that was around there. And now it's, it's, um, it's literally just gone so quickly and so fast that mm -hmm. it, people are now having to figure out how to use it. And that's something, again, that, like Alicia was saying, you know, it's really important that we learn how to use it and learn how to use it for good. The final mm -hmm. thing that I want to teach you guys is to stop focusing on the negative and I want you to start focused on the positive. Now, Alicia has no idea about this, but I like to do these shows and I like to have guinea pigs. And this is nothing to be scared about before, before anybody <laughs> runs away. But... We become what we think, okay? Now, a lot of people would argue with that, but again, if you look around you, everything you can touch, hear, smell, and taste has come from a thought. It doesn't matter whether it's the chairs, the microphones that we're speaking into, the trophies that are behind me, the paintings that are behind me, it all came from a thought. The painting actually came from my thoughts, and that's what we put <laughs> together. Um, but that's another story for another time. So, I want to do an experiment now, guys, and I want you to close your eyes. And Alicia, you can do this as well. You can be my guinea pig for this. I will. And... I want you just to really think about one question. Why do I keep attracting the same kind of experience into my life or the same kind of people into my life? And it's usually because you become what you think about. So to change your self-image, you need to really change how you see yourself. So for example, if I said to Alicia, this is going to be good fun now because <laughs> there'll be a time I'm sure where she, she returns the favor. But all the <laughs> negatives I could um, say to her. So, for example, you know, you're ugly, you're no good, you're worthless. There's nothing good about you at all. There's, you know, you, you're never going to amount to anything. Alicia, in five seconds of doing that, how does that make you feel? Gives you that like... Like, even if your brain saying, no, it's not real, there's like this tingly in the middle of you that's like, maybe it is real. Yeah, right. And it's, yeah. Absolutely. Now, now, often the reason we're doing this experiment, and I'm not going to let us sit that, with that thought too long, but the reason that we're doing this experiment, guys, is because it's the importance of stop comparing yourself to others. Do not allow other people's definition of you to be your definition. So, Alicia, are you ready to feel amazing? Yes. Right. Now, guys, you've noticed I've moved around here a little bit because the energy has to change. So, Alicia, if you close your eyes, and guys watching, if you close your eyes as well. So, if I said to the audience that's watching this all over the world, you are beautiful, you're strong, you can accomplish anything you want to in life, you are powerful, you are passionate, there is nothing that you cannot do. If you can imagine it in your mind and you can see it clearly with enough strength, you can literally achieve it. Remember, 
everything that we see, everything that we are feeling, touch, taste, smell, it is literally something that came from a thought. This show came from a thought. There is nothing that can stop you. You are literally so powerful in your own mind. There is no limitation. Alicia, there's 20 seconds of that. How do you feel? I can see the change in your face. You're beaming. <laughs> it's it's kind of like an endorphin rush it's like yeah it's I can and then it almost starts like sending off other thoughts in your head of like I can do this I can do that what if I do this this and that and it leads to this goal yeah and it's an incredible thing and when you do, I mean my heart rate's going now and to be and, and people <laughs> might say well yeah you're like a motivational coach but here's the crazy thing the things that I've just said verbally is oftentimes what you hear internally. So the amount of times you look in the mirror, for example, and say, oh, well, I don't really like this. I don't really look good in this. I don't like myself. Why are you saying that to yourself? Yeah. What about, hey, let's focus on the positives. I've got a head. It's on my shoulders. Yeah. You know, simple things like that. You can actually, and again, it comes back to the societal um expectations I think where we're not meant to be boastful we're not meant to be proud but there is nothing wrong in saying I love myself I really enjoy who I am and when you can do that you will start to see your whole body change remember when you shift your focus you can actually shift your life so that's the first first topic hopefully that we covered and it makes you guys feel really empowered as well and we want you to comment get in touch with us if you really enjoy this Alicia I believe you're taking topic two which is all about anxiety Absolutely. Um, have you, John, ever struggled with anxiety yourself? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the symptoms that you've, that you've experienced with your anxiety? That, that's a good question. Okay, folks, I got to tell you, my anxiety really got out of control. Um, and this is as an adult, okay? So when my anxiety was at its worst, I was teaching uh, art school. And when I'd be waiting for children to come into our art school, I would literally be sometimes so anxious I would sit on the floor hugging the radiator and terrified of what could be what might be all of these things or even what had been there was times when parents would come in and maybe they'd had a go at their children or the children had been misbehaving and then you're dealing with all this energy and it was more of a fear of okay this is what could be what has been uh you know and you, you're predicting things in your own mind that haven't happened yet mm -hmm. Have you dealt or have you figured out like coping mechanisms oh, to yeah. deal with that? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, we have to, <laughs> especially with kids and parents. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll talk about my coping mechanisms in a moment. I'm interested yeah. to, to, to know your thoughts and, and feelings about anxiety because you've had it as well, obviously. I do. Um, I've, I've started dealing with it since I was young I was like pre-teens when I first had my first anxiety attack and it was absolutely the most frightening experience in my life um do you know sorry, Lisa, that, I was just going to say yeah. the statistically but uh, teenagers between I think it's 12 and 18 it's like 90 percent of them have had anxiety attacks the majority have gone undiagnosed that's a scary been, st statistic I completely believe it. And you know what? So I, my first anxiety attack was literally like right around 12 years old. I completely contribute me being able to learn coping mechanisms to my mom. She, she recognized it. She knew how to handle it. And actually when I got older, I asked her, I was like, why did you never take me somewhere? Cause in my head, I was crazy. Like I, like looking back, I'm like, wow. And she's like, you never were, you know, too out of control. I could always talk you through it. Um, but she was honestly uh, the main reason why mine got caught. And I learned very, very early on how to deal with it. Um, I, yeah, she just kind of taught me ways of thinking, ways of talking to myself. And it's actually exactly this. It's just telling yourself everything's okay. You know, whatever is going to happen is out of your control. It's going to happen. There's nothing you can do about it. So just be okay with this moment. Focus on this moment. And it's those kind of things um, that I, I've learned forever. And actually, I don't think I've, I think my last anxiety attack was, oh gosh, um, it was a while ago now. It was quite a few years ago. Um, and it was just a combination of a lot of, I had like way too much caffeine. I was tired. I ate an Oreo cookie and it just was like, it set me over the edge. <laughs> it was, I was out, I was in a different city and it was just a 
of things happening, but um, I, you know, I have a really great partner. He is um, always there to like calm me down and talk me through it. He kind of learned all the things my mom used to do and now he's that person. So a good support system is huge. And I really attribute my ability to be okay now to that. It's a major thing to have support that's there because again, folks, you know, a lot of people may say, oh, anxiety is normal or anxiety is this. And you know, you may experience anxiety, but here's the thing, you, and you may, and this may, again, conflict with your beliefs, so at least, just be open to it. You actually have the power to do something about it. And how do I know this? It's because I spent so many years studying about anxiety after I was really bad and, um, and, and you know, struggling with it myself. And one of the things is, studies have shown nobody is born with anxiety. Now, how amazing is that? Which means, logically to me, it's something we birth in the mind. If it's birthed in the mind, it's there that it has to be treated. So when you start to break these steps down, because again, I've done interviews with teenagers, I've done interviews with adults, and one of the things when they say to me, oh, I have anxiety, and I'm like, okay, do you understand what anxiety is? And oftentimes they say, no, I haven't got a clue. So clear definition, folks, anxiety, my definition, which can be found in my book, <laughs> The Battles We All Face, it's the first thing that we look at. Anxiety is a fear of what could be or what has been, a fear of what might be or a fear of what has passed okay past future it's very very rarely ever a fear of the present and what often happens is we start to think things in our mind and we get terrified of them do you realize that 40 percent of the stuff that we are terrified about never happens um another 40 percent that we attribute to health never happens so there's two kinds of anxiety that we've you know again covered it, it very 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 rarely if ever happens the actual stuff statistically in the 70s, 60s, 50s, and I believe even to present day, the statistic for the stuff that we worry about that actually happens is 8%. 4%. It's as small as that. But you might say, okay, well, John, that's great. You give me a whole lot of statistics here, and that's fine. But how can I cope if I've got an anxiety attack? Well, let me tell you, my dear friends, because it's actually simpler, again, than a lot of people think. Last year, I had probably my last anxiety attack. I actually tore my midsection through worry. That's a, a severe level of worry. And it was through doing podcasts. It was doing the mind, body, and soul stuff. And I literally worried myself sick. It is possible to do, folks. I have done it. But when I was convalescing, getting better, after um, tearing my midsection, I'm laid up and for some reason I started thinking and my mind just started going all these different directions and I came up with the traffic light system. Now, have you ever heard of the traffic light system, Alicia? I have not. Okay, it's really simple. And again, as a lot of th these things are, and again, it, bear in mind, I'm not a doctor. Okay, that's the first thing I wanna tell you guys, what we're sharing here is from personal experience and there'll be a notification, I'm sure about that on the beginning of the show to cover ourselves. Um, but the traffic light system is this. So you've got four traffic lights. Now you may say, oh, that's a bit weird. Bear with me. First traffic light is green. Everything's feeling good. You're feeling wonderful. You're happy. You're emotional. You're passionate. All of those good kind of things. The second one is amber. Okay. Now I'm teaching you the traffic light system. Okay. And we'll put up a nice <laughs> graphic about it as well. The graphic is what I call the littles. I'm feeling a little bit frustrated, a little bit wound up, a little bit of pain, a little anxiety, all that kind of stuff. The red is where you get to a point of, I'm feeling really, it's the reallys. I'm really wound up, I'm really angry. I'm, you know, and again, when you say, I am really, you are literally you know, uh, confirming things and beliefs about yourself. Again, the messages we speak to, our, you know, to, our spell, to ourselves. Um, and it's the reallys, it's really frustrated, really wound up, all of that kind of stuff. When you get to meltdown stage, which is the fourth one, it's actually brown. We couldn't think of a color. So a friend of mine said, well, the best way I define, you know, before an anxiety attack is you check yourself before you wreck yourself. So literally, I was like, what color would you assign to that? I said, I would go with brown. And I was like, it. okay, and that's the severely. I'm severely annoyed. I'm severe. And this is where your most irrational behavior comes. This is where the anxiety attack is going to take place. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you, if you are in the red stage right now or up into the brown stage, you, you're probably going to have that anxiety attack. That's the first thing, because you, you're already at that place where you want to implement this traffic light system. And it's a daily thing. You can do it a couple of times a day. Very, very simple to do. 
you want to implement it either just having an anxiety attack when you are burnt out, you're emotion free, and it's you know it's like the reset button, or when you're in the green, maybe slight amber stage, and when you do this, you have an awareness of how you're feeling. And if you get to the stage, as Alicia and I were talking uh, before the show came on air, um, she and and but and I am I'm, I hold my hands up to it as well. We can take on too much. We can take on too many different things that are going on. And what tends to happen is then you can get the burnout. So if you start listening to your body a little bit more and listen to your spirit, listen to the things that are inside, and you can say, no, actually, I'm not going to that family event today because I need some time for me. I need to rest. I need to chill out. I need to do what I need to do. And then when you get that point, you can stay in that green amber stage. And, and folks, I can attest to this. I was having anxiety attacks from 2014 all the way to 2019. I haven't had an anxiety attack since December last year, and we're now in the end of April um, 2021. So this is something that's worked for me. I encourage you guys to try it. Alicia, have you, have you any things that you want to add before we move on? Um, I definitely, I love your breakdown of your, because I think I am more or less aware of like that but I've never really like put it into categories like that I feel like that's gonna help me because I actually just got to brown on um Monday this past I I didn't it didn't slip into an anxiety attack but it was a full-on meltdown like crying in the car whole nine so it's you know and I, I was gonna talk about this when you brought it up but um part of what I do with the hair and skincare is gratitude and it's this my whole team, we, every morning we message the whole team. What's one thing that we're grateful for. If, if, it's, if it's your dog next to you, if it's, if it's the sunshine coming in your window, anything that you like that little one thing that you can focus on. Um, I think that feeds into that checking to see where you're at. Are you green or Amber? Um, and I, I think I do it sometimes, but I don't always do it. And I feel like that's where I find myself slipping down the slope. So um, it's definitely a good practice to get into, to just focus on one little thing that you're grateful for keeping yourself in that green amber zone. It's an incredible thing. And when you're grateful as well, you realize how rich you are. And it doesn't have to be big things, folks. It can be, you know, I've got hot water in a tap. Okay, my background, I didn't always have hot water. So when you've got hot water in a tap and you can have a bath, you can have a shower, it's incredible. You have a roof over your head. You know, I lived homeless for a time. So I have, I'm thankful that I have a roof over my head. I'm healthy, I'm well, I'm fit. You can also be thankful for things you don't have. You know, I'm thankful I don't have an illness. I'm thankful I don't have, you know, a big boil on my backside. Make it as simple as you want to make it. But, you know, you got you, when you find the things that you're grateful for, and as Alicia said, you know, make it a daily practice. For me, I, I literally have changed my thinking completely. And when you do that, you'll find that your life really starts to change as well. Okay, now comes to the fun part, because once again, Alicia is going to be my guinea pig. And guys, if you've got a pen and paper um, beside you, I would encourage you to do this as well, because we're going to do a thing called goal setting. A lot of overwhelm comes to teenagers and adults, let's face it, all of us, when we feel overwhelmed, but specifically that age group of 16, maybe 18 year olds when they're leaving school and they're trying to figure out what's going on next. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say too much more about that just now. I, I want to get Alicia's um, kind of feedback. Have you ever felt nervous or anxious when somebody says, what do you want to do with your life? <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's very funny that I am doing this now because I just recently <clears throat> kind of hit a wall with my career and I actually put in my two week notice recently. So I'm, I'm quitting my job. I'm done on this Thursday coming up and everybody's asking me, what are you going to do next? And it, and I actually don't, I actually don't know. I'm actually taking a step back. I am going to do a couple part-time jobs right now and just really give myself the space to figure it out. Um, I was actually one of the kids that coming out of high school, college, I actually was like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make it happen. And then life, <laughs> life happened and you have to adjust and kind of go with the punches. But, you know, I'm learning that, you know, you need to sometimes take a moment, take a step back and it's kind of okay to not know where you're going to go. 
<laughs> it's it's an interesting thing. Now, I, would you set out, for example, on an adventure without knowing where you were going to end up? Are you one of those people? No, I'm not. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. The reason that I ask that is because a lot of people say that. It's like, John, why on earth would I set out on an adventure without knowing where I'm going? And I'm like, well, why would you do the same with your life? You know, and, and that's oftentimes what causes the overwhelm. But here's the kicker, folks. And I'm sure even Alicia in, in the United States, you'll probably back this up. What I'm about to teach you, because you know what's coming. Um, part of it, she knows what's coming. She doesn't know the full thing. But it's an incredible thing, folks. This is really amazing that you can literally get a goal and your life's plan. And I'm going to show you how probably in 10 minutes. OK, and we're going to do this. We're going to do this real time. And plus, it validates how good a life coach and practice we all run. But would you say that this is something in terms of goal setting that is taught in schools in the United States? No, no. there's a lot of life skills <laughs> that are not taught. <laughs> how to cope being one of them. <laughs> yeah, really emotional, like, stability. Yeah. Well, okay, here we go. So, <laughs> Alicia. Mm -hmm. What are you passionate about in life? I am. I think when it boils down to it, I'm passionate about art and design and creativity. Okay. What would be your ideal job in the future? If, if limitations were nothing, what would it be? I would love to freelance design work and run me and my partner's painting business. Yeah. Goody. <laughs> I like when these things are easy because I don't know the answers to this, folks, by the way. <laughs> this is all happening real time. OK, so whenever you are setting a goal, the thing that you got to do, first of all, is figure out your end point, your destination, which is why I asked the question, do you know your destination? So your end goal is to, if I'm interpreting this right, you want to be a freelance artist. You want to uh, help run the art business. You want to be involved in the art business, pretty much. Okay, so you know the goal. Now all you got to do is figure out the steps to get there. So yeah. with my background in art, folks, this should be easy. <laughs> so, step number one would be, well, you figured out your goal. That is step number one. Step number two is, okay, what experience do you have in terms of business? Now, you might think, well, that's a little bit strange, John. Why would you be asking this? By the way, Alicia is writing this down. When we're really doing this, folks. Um, yeah. But you might say, well, John, she wants to be an artist. Why on earth does she need to learn business? Simple. Because you can be the best artist in the world. You can be the best photographer in the world. You can be the best singer in the world. But if you don't know how to market your skills, in other words, get people to see your stuff, it doesn't matter how good you are, you are never going to sell anything. So there's two things you need to know. So, like I said, step number two is marketing. Do you have a background in marketing, just out of interest? I actually, um, not formally, but I, I do it. I've been doing it for about two years at my job. Good. Yeah. You're already one step ahead of the game. Cool. Number three, learn sales. Now, you may be able to market to people and you may be able to show them beautiful paintings and say, oh, look at the beautiful painting that I made. And I do this frequently, but people look at you and say, well, John, that's great. You do some great artwork. Mm, now what? What about if I could say to people, are you looking for phenomenal artwork? You've come to the right place. We do portraits, pets, and nature paintings all under one roof. That means that no one needs to find another artist. This is actually on our website, by the way at johnmorrisartfromtheheart.com. Literally, I know because I've just designed, I've just finished designing the website and this is the, you know, when you get clear on your message. So for example, then people look and said, oh wow, well I don't need to find another artist. He does portraits, he does pets, he does this. You lead people through the process, but you start a conversation with people. Alicia and I, you know, again, we've just met for the first time today and conversation is just really easy flowing. How do you find selling? Selling. Oh, um, so I, that was a big actual fear of mine for a very long time. Um, and actually not so much with my artwork. Yeah, go on. I was just going to say, quick question. How do you see sales? Now, what I mean by that is, do you see sales as I'm bugging and annoying people? Or do you see sales as I'm actually, you know, she's just laughing. If you guys could see this now, because she knows that I'm clicking things here. This is literally what we do with teenagers, folks. Um, 
do you see sales as it's really helping people or do you see pay, uh, sales as it's really an annoyance and I'm disturbing people? So I, once I started, when I started doing hair and skincare selling on, on social media, that's actually where that transition happened for me. I used to look at it as like, I'm just annoying people. I want something from them, but I shifted it a little bit and I'm still in the process. That's okay. Of doing it. But now I'm trying to, to approach situations of like, I want to help them. I want to. I want to give them something. And here's the crazy That's thing, folks. Sorry, go on, Alicia. I, I cut you off there. I apologize. No, that was it. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, so for example, you can do this with anything in on the face of the planet, folks. If you really figure out how this is helping someone and how, you know, you're, you're not, you, you've got to find, first of all, if, if you're going into sales, and again, we're speaking here about paintings, okay? This is very, very specific. Um, you got to figure out a way uh, in your own mind of saying, well, I'm not actually annoying people. I'm actually providing a service. Now, you might say, well, John, you know, how on earth do I do that? Because I talk to people and I'm like, you know, uh, I just find that I'm talking at them about my paintings. That's because you're trying to sell. What you want to try and do is build a relationship. So if I say for you, for example, Alicia, that painting I've got behind me, are you going to buy it? What's your answer <laughs> going to be? Uh... Exactly. I don't know. Right. Okay. <laughs> But if I said to you, for example, now what you imagine, you know, you're in, you know, a, a big home and it's got maybe nice big windows. There's enough light that comes in, but the walls are beige, like an old granny color beige. Now, if I said to you, Alicia, one of my paintings, large paintings can not only brighten up your home, change your mindset from negative to positive, but every day you love it, you see powerful and passionate colors but it can also make you jealous of other people because when they find out what you've got, they're gonna want it as well. Which are you more inclined to want to work with there? Oh, that one. There you go. <laughs> now that, that's the whole thing behind it, folks. So step number three, like I say, is learn sales. Learn that you are passionate about a product. And again, I can look around, I'm looking at this window right here. You know, we create windows so, you know, you don't feel the cold or you don't, or in Scotland, for example, you don't get blasted by a 90 mile an hour gust. Our windows will keep you safe, secure and warm. Bang. You've learned sales. OK, so when you learn sales and marketing, there's two major things. And then the process is figuring out, OK, what, you know, step four would be, what does it look like for me to be working with my partner, for me to be selling my own artwork? Where am I going to sell it? So then you do your research. So literally, if I remember the steps, step one is figure out the goal. Step two, learn marketing. Step three, learn sales. Step four, do your research. Step five, do it. <laughs> that's, the, that's the final thing for us because a lot of people have these great ideas in their mind and they don't do it. So that's one thing for art. I'm going to do one really, really quick because I had this with a client of mine and this he wanted to be a history teacher, okay? Now, his mom got in touch, he was uh, 17 years old, and his mom got in touch with me and said, John, he's no motivation, he's nothing about him, you know, what do I do? I said, give me 25 minutes. And I said, right, what are you passionate about? And he said, I'm passionate about helping people, I'm passionate about teaching, and I'm passionate, there was something else that he said, I'm, passion oh, I'm, I'm passionate about history. I was like, right, okay. Have you ever thought about being a history teacher? And he said, well, oddly enough, yeah. I was like, right, there's your goal. It's something you're passionate about, something you love, something that's going to keep you when times get tough. And I said, then walk through the steps. I said, what's your education? And he said, well, I've, I've got a really good education. And he, he was mostly A's and B's. I thought, brilliant. Okay, so now we've got something. Okay, and then where are you going to go next? Are you going to study at university? Yes. Which university are you going to study at? What course are you going to study at? And then when he's figured all that out, and then when you get to the end part, he's graduated from university, he's applying for jobs, bing, bang, boom. And then he's teaching um, history. Now, he's actually going into jobs um, and, and to look for jobs right now because he's taking a gap year. But we walked him through as well how to secure a job. And that's something I want to cover with you guys next time. Alicia, how was that? Um, was that information, as, as someone that's heard it for the first time, something that really helped you? Absolutely. Because, like, I'm a... I'm a list person. I need, I'm a visual person, obviously. So I need to see things broken down. And sometimes it is as easy as just writing it down that finally it's like, okay, yeah. Check, 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 check. Got it. Because that's the crazy thing. Once you visualize it in your mind and you're committed to doing it, there is literally nothing that can stop you from doing it. 
and you just keep it in your mind. This is what I am. This is who I am, you know, and yes, I may be known as a psychologist in training, but I'm going to be known very soon as Dr. John Morris, which is fantastic. And then it opens up all these other doors. Why? Because I visualized it in my mind and then I went after it. Alicia, is there anything that you want to uh, share with us before we wrap up today's show? Um, I think the the one thing I want to just say about your your five steps is that number five, doing it. Um, I I can be an over planner. I can be somebody who is like I got to plan everything out to be before I do anything. And I have learned that it's sometimes you just have to do it. Like sometimes if you don't even know exactly what you're doing. You just have to start and you'll figure it out because if you don't ever start, you're never going to get there. And the secret to it, folks, is plan enough for today. Don't yeah. worry about tomorrow, next week, next month or whatever, but plan enough for today. And I normally do between three and five things. The first two are normally really simple things. And then the next three are the ones that's going to take you from where you are to where you want to be. And it doesn't matter your age. It's something that you can do pretty much any time. Um, so is yeah. there anything that you want to say before we wrap up for today's show? Anything we've got? Um, just, you know, have faith in yourself, be confident, you know, figure, like, be willing to listen to yourself, be okay with maybe being not exactly what everybody wants, and, and it all is going to work itself out, I promise. Absolutely, <laughs> and it does, I mean, we, we all end up, oftentimes we're exactly where we're meant to be which is an incredible yeah. thing. But guys, I want to thank you so much for watching. If you guys have got any questions for us, do get in touch with us, obviously, at thebattlesweallface.com or in the chat bar below. Don't forget, as always, to like, share, and subscribe. Do all that good stuff. Tell a friend because it could be the very thing that they need to hear in their darkest hour and for them to make sense. And if you're interested in supporting the show and the network, of course, you can head to patreon.com forward slash the battles we all face and you can support us there. We've got some great content that's on there exclusive to Patreon and of course we've got life coaching and so much more guys that you can check out and want to thank you so much for watching so until next time take care god bless we'll see you next time and have a great weekend